Welcome back, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support this program and you're not allergic to reading, you could subscribe to the Substack at aksum.substack.com. That's a k s u m dot substack.com. You can also go to patreon.com slash toahdo. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash t e w a h i d o. Today, I am joined by Dr. Candice Lukasik, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis's John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Personally, even though a lot of people find those two to be the topics you shouldn't be discussing at dinner tables and gala events, those are the ones most fascinating to me. So I'm glad that you are being hired by such a center. And she got her PhD recently in sociocultural anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. Should be noted, it is the top UC in my home state of California. So shout out to that. It's also a very cool city. Whenever I am in Oakland and I go to Oakland a lot, I always like own a little neat shops in, in Berkeley. And, and a funny side note about Berkeley is you can go to the city of Berkeley at the University of California, Berkeley, and go to the philosophy department and realize that it's named after a British guy named George Barclay. So it's pronounced yeah. totally differently. <laughs> and as someone who's lived in uh, the East Coast, the Midwest and the West Coast, I'm sure you can appreciate the different uh, regional accent differences um, in, in English as well. I, I know that you and I actually connected through the uh, Zorhab Center, which is mm -hmm. an Armenian center in New York, when you and Dr. Christopher Shekleyan and I were invited to a panel, and you were the Coptic person. And in my head, you know, for me, I didn't question it at all. You know, you speak Arabic fluently, both the Egyptian dialect and the 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 Fusha, the modern standard Arabic. So for me, I've seen Copts that look or at least appear just like you do. And I've seen some that look like they could be my aunties. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your conversion to the Coptic faith and what your faith background was before that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I love watching it. Um, and it's been a pleasure to get to know you over uh, the last few months. Um, and, you know, in general, though, like I... And this has been something that has come up um, a lot in the past, I would say, six months, um, is um, my relationship to like the Coptic Orthodox Church as a white convert to it um, in the United States. Um, I came to the church through Egypt. Um, I did a, an Arabic program there um, in 2007 um, and um, attended my first liturgy, my first Coptic Orthodox liturgy um, in Cairo when I was there. Um, and, uh, you know, thereafter I started to, to attend liturgy in the United States in Buffalo, New York, where I currently am as well. Um, and we'll be celebrating, uh, the Blessed Nativity this evening at the same church that I started to go to in 2007. Um, and I, you know, I think that over the past, you know, decade or so, my relationship to the church, um, has grown and developed, um, and my positionality within it, as well as a scholar of Coptic Orthodoxy, um, has, uh, I think, been challenged um, in many ways. Like, as a white person in a church of color in the U.S., um, you know, I've had to really think about what that means and what my responsibility is in terms of my work, but also in terms of, you know, me as a congregant um, with other folks of color that have to deal with different things in American society than I do or have in my life. Um, I grew up Polish Catholic in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I was very close to um, a church here that my great-great-grandmother built um, in Chichawaga, New York, a, a predominantly Polish suburb. Um, and she came from Poland in the early 20th century, actually by herself when she was 17 years old. Um, and she was very close to the Catholic Church uh, once she arrived here, as many other immigrants, um, you know, coming from, from Europe as well, in their kind of ethnic parishes, whether they be Polish, German, et cetera. Um, but Polish Catholics in Buffalo have really remained 
strong. Um, there are, which is a suburb of Buffalo, um, where Polish Catholics kind of really cherish their um, ethnic and religious heritage. And so that's kind of what I carried into my experience in, um, in the Coptic Orthodox Church and really kind of going deeper into my, my faith, my Christian faith through it. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, the story is too long and too complicated to, to go on. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you, Candice. If, if I may, um, before we conclude that story, I know that in the United States, you, you know, you refer to yourself as white and, you know, that's, that's certainly one way of looking at things, but there's this way in which I've heard you speak on other people's programs like Ambasuriyet, that there are general identities like, you know, Arab or more particular identities like Copt. And the same thing, traditionally in the United States, in you know the humanities and the social sciences, when Americans are studied, that original kind of 1600, 1700 stock, as opposed to you know the stock that you're talking about of your own from the early 20th century, is considered WASP. That is to say, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And certainly, Polish fulfills the white aspect of it. But I don't believe that you're either Anglo or Saxon or Protestant. Was there any sense at all of of otherness from the the wasp stock of America, or had the Polish Americans already, by the time you grew up, you know, been fully grafted into the the privilege of either legal whiteness or you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, whiteness? Because I I grew up around some white people who would say are you Catholic or are you Christian? As if those two things mm -hmm. are incompatible. Um, I would say at this point, if, if we're talking about kind of the ethnic differences among white folks uh, in, in Western Europe, in Buffalo, uh, ignorance and all of these things that um, the kind of Italian groups in Buffalo or the Irish folks in Buffalo, which are, you know, also kind of segregated in their different neighborhoods. Even until today, that there is um, kind of a marked difference in terms of how One is legally me up in the city of Buffalo. something that kind of remains until today. Like for example, um, it, Polish folks have a tradition um, after uh, Easter, the day after Easter um, is known as Dingus Day. Um, and the biggest celebration of Dingus Day is in, is in Buffalo, New York, actually outside of, outside of Poland and Eastern Europe. Uh, and Dingus Day is kind of this kind of a celebration of ending the fast and, uh, and uh, kind of a, a celebration of the spring and fertility. So, for example, uh, women are usually uh, doused in water, right, as a symbol of you know spring and fertility and and, and all of these things uh, by the men. And women hit men with pussy willows. These like uh, these this how can I describe it? It's a plant. Uh, it's like a stick that has like little kind of cotton balls on it, and you hit men with it. Uh, and so it's it's kind of a funny little tradition. Uh, but it's something that is very particular to Polish Buffalo, right? And so what ends up happening every year is that Polish people from the suburbs of Buffalo come back to the city, 
right? And they have a large, you know, parade and all these things in now what is a predominantly black neighborhood, right? Not only black, but immigrant neighborhood as well. There are different Arab communities, Middle Eastern communities that are there, African immigrant communities that are there. Um, and they celebrate in what was the old Polish neighborhood. So it's, there's a very interesting racial dynamic uh, to uh, being Polish uh, in Buffalo, New York over the past you know, 20, 30 years. Thank you. That's so fascinating. And, and growing up, you know, I heard the word dingus and people kind of use it as an insult. So it's funny to hear the cultural context uh, behind some of these. It it reminds me of, um, gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting it now, but um, there's a, a word Bugs Bunny used to use in reference to the uh, the hunter of Genesis. And he used to use it mm -hmm. towards Elmer Fudd. But a whole generation of people who just watched a cartoon lacking the genesis context of the word just thought it meant something equivalent to how dingus is used to mean someone who uh is maybe not the <laughs> the best scholar let's say like uh like you are so that that's a, a good segue to your scholarly interest what what stuck out to me about some of your interests is also the alliteration that you use as someone who loves language. You have Coptic Christians, martyrs, and migrants. What what got you interested in in this intersection between you know martyrdom, migration, and this this religious identity, so that you would be at a center of of politics and religion? Yeah. Um, I think that I've always been, um, I mean, in general, I think that I've always been fascinated with um, religious and political life. Um, you know, growing up, uh, Polish Catholic, um, very involved in the church, um, you know, even considering being a nun at one point in time when I was 12 years old. And, you know, throughout high school, kind of being involved in more progressive politics, like writing on um, uh, at the time, the Iraq war, writing against the Iraq war, um, even in high school. And so when I went to, to Egypt uh, in 2007, um, a few years prior to that, I had kind of distanced myself from the Catholic church uh, a bit, as kind of many folks when they're, you know, growing up in high school tend to, to do with their religious traditions. Um, and going to Egypt and experiencing the liturgy and kind of having a spiritual rejuvenation um, I really became kind of um, connected to my faith in a way that I hadn't previously. Um, and so I really kind of delved deep into what the kind of Coptic religious tradition was. And, you know, central to it um, is obviously martyrdom and persecution, um, centuries of it, whether it be under, you know, Byzantine or Islamic rule. Um, and kind of experiencing that in different different ways. So, for example, learning the same stories or visiting monasteries, um, you know, uh, visiting uh, uh, different churches like throughout Egypt, hearing stories not only of um, folks that are kind of uh, reiterating like what has happened in the past, like telling a same story, but like through the perspective of of like kind of everyday lived experience, like how they kind of connect with this saint in you know. Uh, uh, how they experience discrimination like every day, right? Like that I'm, I, I am experiencing martyrdom every day um, by living out my faith like St. Nina or, or you know, a, a, any number of saints, right? Or even St. Samuel the Confessor. Um, and so it was kind of in Egypt since 2007 and I've you know, gone back every year and did um, you know, a couple of years of field work in Egypt itself. Um, I really got connected to like the religious tradition through like folks in Egypt, right? And so when I co would come back to the United States and go to liturgy here, right? I really tried to separate, um, I think, kind of what I was learning in Egypt from what I was kind of experiencing in the United States in order to keep, kind of keep my per personal and professional life almost separated, right? Like I was learning things about my faith in Egypt, but um, at the same time, I came back to the States and knew that my positionality, not only like as a white person, but as a convert was quite different, right? Um, and so, you know, in keeping those things separated, I learned different things about uh, the Coptic church, both in Egypt and then in the US. And so when I decided to kind of center my dissertation project 
around immigration, it was really because I was noticing that there were many more people, folks that I had known in Egypt had kind of grown in the faith with them in you know places like Cairo and Alexandria who were coming to the U.S. Um, ever increasingly, the U.S., Canada, et cetera, but, but mainly in the United States. Um, and so I really wanted to think about like why that was happening, how that was happening, and what the ramifications were for kind of the, uh, like the Coptic Church for this religious tradition that I had become a part of, um, you know, here in the U.S. as well as in Egypt. Um, and so that's really kind of where um, where the project uh, stemmed from was both kind of personal a personal journey, but also really a, you know an empirical fact of you know cops immigrating uh, in droves to the United States through things like the green card lottery, as well as asylum and family reunification. Yes, I've I've been witness to that. I had two close family friends who, uh, one passed away a few years ago, but one still lives in that that building that is right next to St. Mark's, that first Coptic parish in Los Angeles. And I saw with my own eyes uh, these communities who formed, you know, their own more American Coptic parishes. Um, for example, my cousin attends Holy Resurrection, and I've been there a number of times, as I've also been to St. Mark's. And so I've seen the kind of generational difference, as you said, between Copts who came maybe in the 50s and 60s versus Copts who are, are coming in now. What, what's interesting about that is you were drawn to Egypt in Arabic, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the services have a lot of Coptic. I don't know what the ratio of the Coptic language as opposed to the people versus Arabic was in um, in Egypt. But I know that one of the things that I noticed changing and one of the things that at least I've heard could be many factors that are cultural and associated with it. But one of the factors that I heard is an increased usage of Arabic and Coptic versus the English in the United States. I'm, I'm wondering what type of ratio did you see in Egypt versus um, the, the parishes that you were attending in upstate New York? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I think it varied uh, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I've attended a number of Coptic liturgies completely in Coptic particularly wow. in Upper Egypt. Yeah, so that was that was a challenge for me because at least I do understand Arabic. Um, you know, I am a little bit elementary in terms of my Coptic even until today, right? Um, which I'm which is an embarrassment for me and I I am working on it. Um, but uh, it varied. I think being in Cairo and Alexandria, most of the liturgy uh, the, the liturgies that I attended were in Arabic and, you know, obviously Coptic used in different portions throughout. Um, but in the US, I, you know, in Buffalo, um, it was kind of a similar mix, I'm going to be honest. Um, and so going to some of these parishes, um, uh, like, um, at least in, um, in Southern California, like St. Basil's, um, uh, and, and um, among others, um, Christ the, the Good Shepherd, um, where there are, there is a little bit more English than there is Arabic or Coptic, or actually, you know, no Arabic, um, and in some cases, very little Coptic. Um, that's kind of, that's, that's a little jarring to me, because I came to the liturgy through Arabic and Coptic, um, and so that's kind of what I continue to prefer in the United States. Um, I attended liturgy for, you know, five, six years in Hayward, California, at San Antonio. Um, and there's, there's was also a mixture of this. Um, they had a whole kind of liturgy of Arabic um, and then some Arabic, English, and Coptic. Uh, and I preferred the mixture, um, as well as in Jersey City, at St. George and St. Shinduda, where I attended for a couple of years during field work. Um, theirs is also a mixture. And but what's interesting about St. George and St. Shinduda is that because of the influx of immigrants, they have kind of three separate liturgies happening at the same time. One is in English, one is in Arabic for those from Cairo and Alexandria, and then there's another for folks from Upper Egypt that have kind of a little bit, have, it's called the children's liturgy, they have more children. Um, not specifically for Upper Egyptians, but usually a lot of Upper Egyptians that are new immigrants come and they're, you know, uh, uh, new families, and so they have, you know, uh, some younger children uh, that are there. And so there's kind of a 
class divide as well as a linguistic divide and a generational divide that's happening there. And it's very interesting. Um, and I found it to be really, actually it deepened my faith uh, a lot to see the kind of interactions between these different generations, uh, some with conflict and some with cooperation. So. I was just going to say that is very interesting in our, in my own, you know, Ethiopian and Eritrean communities. We're always, you know, struggling with that. You know, for us, historically it was Giz, now it's Amharic and Tigrinya, and then increasingly it's English. And I've been a, one of the kind of pioneers and spearheads of, of the English. At the same time, I've been one of those Ethiopian Americans who's been deeply interested in the ancient languages like Giz. So I appreciate that you are tough on yourself, even though obviously it's amazing that, you know, in addition to Espanol and uh, Ingles, you picked up the dialectical Arabic and the, the modern standard. Usually someone's got to pick between those two, especially when they're learning it as a second or a third and a fourth language. Now you're being tough on yourself for not picking up a fifth language of Coptic, which isn't even really spoken, but only in the liturgical realm. But I, I appreciate that it shows your your curiosity is is endless and you keep going for it. And with this kind of curiosity of yours, you looked beyond just Coptic church as an individual entity and the Oriental Orthodox communion writ large. Could you tell us about the Oriental Orthodox Solidarity Project? I had Deacon Alam on before, and I believe it was originally through him and through my friend, uh, my Coptic friend, Peter Aziz, that I first learned about the Oriental Orthodox Solidarity Project. And I know you're also one of the movers of Shakers over there. Yeah, um, and it's been great to be connected to you through through Deacon Adam, and, and it's been a blessing, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna start by uh, a little kind of a, a vignette of sorts to, to think about why the Oriental Orthodox Solidarity Project is so important. Um, you know, you mentioned that you've been to Oakland a number of times, I'm assuming to go also to liturgy there. Um, yes. And what has been quite sad, I'm going to be, to, to be frank, is that there is a large Coptic population at, that goes to UC Berkeley. They're called Cal Cops. We have our own little bit group there. And I went, was at Berkeley for, you know, six, seven years. And we had always planned to go to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church that uh, is literally next to the BART station in, in, in Oakland. You can see it when you're, when you're on, the, uh, on the train. Um, but we needed somebody to kind of uh, uh, be our, um, like our, not chaperone, but kind of uh, um, invite us there, right? Because we didn't want to appear as outsiders too. Um, but we didn't, you know, make the active effort to go and spend time with our Ethiopian sisters and brothers, right? Even though, you know, there's a huge Ethiopian Orthodox population in the Bay Area, right? And so, in thinking about that and thinking about the kind of divides even in the United States between our between our churches um, that we're you know we're in the, we're in theological union with each other we're in communion with each other and we can celebrate with one another um, but there has been you know certain the ways in which we've been kind of siloed into our different churches and not um, kind of experiencing that union with one another. So myself and like another, a number of other scholars, as well as, um, you know, activists and community organizers, um, when the murder of George Floyd happened um, in June of last year, um, it really affected uh, a number of, of folks and particularly Coptic folks. Um, and knowing the, the kind of work that I was doing, uh, a couple of women, uh, Veronica Salema and Justina Magella, uh, reached out to me because um, they were very affected by uh, what uh, was happening in, in our country. And they wanted to respond as a faith community, do something, um, because this is obviously not just a problem in American society, but within uh, many, in different ways, within the Orient Orthodox churches, kind of racism and anti-Blackness, et cetera. And it comes out in different forms, right? Not just through whiteness, but maybe kind of separating um, from black identity um, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, and so we really thought, well, what could be our kind of contribution to this movement happening? 
And I really wanted to emphasize that um, that the Coptic Church is not alone in some of the things that it is facing internally in terms of um, anti-Black racism um, and kind of prejudice in general in the U.S. we're talking about, right? Um, but it is something that we can kind of think about as a family of churches together because we are all in American society and we all have to deal with the legacies of slavery, of, of racism, of, I mean, continued racism, clearly, whether institutional or everyday prejudice. Um, and we should be tackling this together through our different traditions, right? Um, and our different kind of history that, that, you know, seems to come together in many ways. And I would argue, you know, thinking about how, you know, the different Oriental Orthodox churches from South Asia, from the Middle East, from Africa have experienced, uh, you know, colonialism and, you know, subjugation and imperialism um, and have experienced, uh, you know, different forms of racial hierarchies that have, you know, uh, certain translations in the U.S., but also kind of interface with um, the kind of black white binary um, in the United States as well. And so over the past seven, six, seven months, um, we've been meeting as a group, um, you know, different representatives from each of our churches. Um, we are, you know, to be frank, and uh, I'll say this because it, it is a call for participation, we are lacking in the Eritrean Orthodox Church. Uh, and for any Eritreans that are out there, we would love for you to, to become a part of, of this movement. Um, we're trying to both learn from one another and learn from our traditions and our experiences of migration and conversion, et cetera, in the United States. Um, our internal experiences uh, in terms of uh, different forms of, of anti-Black racism uh, and other forms of racism in our churches um, and our position, like what we can contribute as a church community to um, uh, kind of anti-racist futures in the United States, right? Um, you have kind of movements from different Protestant churches, the Catholic church, et cetera, different faith communities that are really trying to contribute to this conversation. And we as Oriental Orthodox, we can also contribute to this conversation, uh, not only on a national level, but internally within each of our churches by learning from one another and by also kind of um, getting educated about the issues uh, within American society. Yeah, it's funny. I <clears throat> My fiance is Eritrean, so I reached out to her. I reached out to a bunch of people she knows. I reached out to a lot of people. So I did my work. I reached out to a lot of Eritreans I knew. I'll tell you a funny kind of side note. And, you know, this may or may not be a factor, but it's interesting. You know, obviously, the Eritrean church was a part of the Ethiopian church. And even to this day, they haven't fully converted all of the traditional teachings into Tigrinya. Uh, you know, Amharic, in some sense, is their language. And in some sense, it was imposed upon them for some time when they were a part of the empire. And uh, so some of their resources are still in Amharic. A lot of them still travel to Gondar, which is an Amharic speaking region, to go get certified in the traditional schools of Ethiopia. Even amidst the civil war, they used to do that. And one of the interesting things about Ethiopia is you have at least four or five ethnicities within Ethiopia that are distinct and that are all a part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Whereas really, for the most part, it's one ethnicity in Eritrea. That's a part of the Orthodox Church. That is the Tigrinya ethnicity. But there's also, uh, sounds similar, and a lot of people <clears throat> confuse it. It's called Tigra. It's a different ethnicity, particularly in the city of Karen, where uh, in more northern Eritrea, north of Asmara, the capital city, you have some folks from there who are also Orthodox. But a lot of them are Catholic, too. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And... Um, it's it's very interesting how um, I think each of the members of the Oriental Orthodox community always, when we are trying to critique ourselves, want to boast about who is the most ethnic enclave, who is the most internally. I've heard some Armenians' friends claim that they're the most nationalistic and internally looking. I've heard some Ethiopians say it about themselves. I've heard Eritreans say it about themselves. I don't know if Copts would say it about themselves and. But I don't know about the Indians and the, and the Syrians, but um, it's interesting that projects like this are allowing us to work with one another. And I, I really do appreciate that. I hope people listen to that call. And I know you've already begun publishing pieces. Is, is that right? 
Yeah. So, um, so we just launched the website about um, a week and a half ago or a week ago. I'm, I'm sorry, it's the 6th of January. So about six days ago, uh, we launched the website um, and we, you know, have some kind of uh, different videos that have been published, like your interview with, with Deacon Adam is, is, is there. Um, and we have uh, kind of a few other pieces that uh, were drawn from other websites, but we have published our first piece from Dr. Chris Sheckley in thinking about um, what the Armenian tradition um, and as a tribute to um, the particular conversation or state. Um, original pieces just in the US and also just on the human person and on racism and anti-blackness and kind of what that means for our traditions in diaspora in the United States. Um, so God willing, we'll have Deacon Adams piece uh, that will kind of focus from the Ethiopian perspective um, on some of this um, in, in another week or so. And we hope to kind of really highlight the different perspectives of our churches. One of the things that's really important, and, and especially to me, but to many a part of this project, is that we really don't know our sister churches. We need to kind of be in their, um, in their space and, and experience what Oriental Orthodoxy is from, from their perspective too. Right, I think that the Ethiopian church's relationship to the Coptic church has been a a complicated one, a fraught one. Uh, I mean, and that's part of the reason why I find it to be so interesting that in seven years of being at Berkeley, a group of Copts really wanted to go visit the Ethiopian church, but it, it never came to fruition, right? Even though those are our sisters and brothers in Oriental Orthodoxy. And, you know, I think that that part of that is we need to really understand what our Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters are facing in the United States in different ways, both racially, politically, et cetera, right? I don't think that, I think cops from kind of a Coptic Cop Orthodox from a general perspective understand what it's like to be in pain over what's happening in the homeland. But I think, it, you know, it, it's quite another thing to know the details of those those conflicts, like from what happened last year in Ethiopia and what is continuing to, to happen. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a way in which we can learn from one another that can contribute to how we envision racial justice in the U.S. as well. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Um, I, like I said, have deep roots in Oakland and really the whole Bay Area. So offline and post-COVID, it's funny, I already spoke with um, <clears throat> someone who had similar interests of a Protestant background, but who teaches at a Catholic university as a New Testament professor. Uh, he was on my program. So I've made a similar type of uh, arrangement with him, but now I'm going to make one with you too. We're going to bring some cops uh, from the Coptic club, whoever's still there, and we're going to take them to Oakland because I have a deep connection there. And um, there is a, someone there, he's a uh, he's about our age and he's he serves as a deacon as well as kind of as an archdeacon as well as a, a head cantor in the traditional school. He's called a Marigeta. And he's always he's always trying to lure me back to Oakland. He used to I was living in Merced for a little bit in central California. And sometimes, you know, he would he would be so crazy as to drive to Merced to pick me up just to ensure that I would go and teach his Sunday school kids. And I, I know. Uh, that community there would would uh, welcome the cops with open arms. They even travel to Greek monasteries, you know what I mean? So that's outside of our communion. So especially within our communion, we definitely need to foster more of these relationships and we'll have more of these conversations as this goes on. Um, we'll have it in the show notes, but could you go ahead and plug for us the, the website where they can find Dr. Sheklian's piece and uh, video with me and Alam, as well as any social media outlets that you all are using. Yeah. You'll see kind of, um, I'll, I'll look very quickly uh, as to where uh, these things are. So under our library, there's a, a bunch of different sections that um, 
uh, have both, you know, Dr. Chris Sheckling's piece, um, but the different videos as well, but those are under our library. Um, but orientalorthodoxsolidarity.org, that's the, that's the website. Shukran Abibti, thank you so much for coming on. And unless you have any parting thoughts, uh, I think this would be a, a great place for us to close and allow us room to have many more conversations down the line. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for having me on. And, and any folks that are part of um, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, if you want to be a part of this project in any capacity, um, I'm sure that um, uh, uh, my email will be shared and, and please contact us like through the website as well, orientorthodoxsolidarity.org. Um, we're really excited about this project and we want to bring more diverse folks um, on um, from all of our churches.